All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our um, Hangout on Air webinar this evening about POGO, Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. Um, I'm Jen Rosado from the Mobile CSP team, and we're really excited to have you here and to have our guests here as well. So over the last year, in looking at the Mobile CSP curriculum, and oh, I'm going to have to pause for just a moment. <laughs> you could probably hear that in the background, my apologies. Um, so over the last year, the mobile CSP team looked at the uh, curriculum and did some updates to it. And one of the updates that we made was to convert some of the lessons so that they use a POGO-like process. Um, we wanted to make sure that the lessons had some active learning strategies in there that would be good for all students in the course and that we were um, doing a little bit more to emphasize collaborative learning. So that's one of the advantages of Pogel. I'm going to um, just introduce you real quick, the people in the Hangout, and then uh, they can get started with the presentation. So we have Cassie Beckworth and Sherry Lucarelli from the online team here as well. A little wave high. And then um, we have Cliff Kussmall and Helen Hu from the um, Computer Science Pogel group. <laughs> Tammy Perman um, is hoping to join us here very shortly. She just had some technical difficulties that we're hoping are going to be fixed. So I'll turn it over to you now, Cliff. Okay, let's see. Share. Okay, does everyone see that? Yep. Okay, so. Uh, thank you, Jen. Um, as she said, I'm Cliff Cosmall. I teach at Muhlenberg College. Tammy will join us in a little bit. She teaches at the School District of Springfield Township outside of Philadelphia. And Helen teaches at Westminster College in Salt Lake City. And we've been doing this approach called Pogol in various forms for, what, five years, Helen? Something like that? And and so we're going to sort of talk about a little bit about the background, more about sort of what as teachers different in a Pogo classroom and how to think about it. So a little bit on the background of how things work. I'll sort of run quickly through an example of what a Pogo classroom might feel like. We'll talk a little bit about some evidence and then talk about some of the techniques and strategies people use in classes and try to leave some time for questions at the end. So objectives and outcomes, you know, we're, we, this is sort of a Google thing. We always try to think about what is it we're trying to do before we do it. So just what are the outcomes that we're trying to help our students achieve? What are the key elements of Pogel and what are some of the, the techniques we use? So I guess, you know, one thing that, that we all realize as teachers is that we're always under pressure to teach more, but when we try to teach more, students often actually learn less. And so I think that the thing that I try to remember is to focus on what are the really important concepts that students really need to get. And if they really get those concepts, then it'll be easier for them to figure out other details. <coughs> Sorry, the, the other thing I, I think a lot about is what are the skills students need to develop? And, you know, we, we think about the content in our courses, but in reality, really what students need to learn are things like how to communicate, how to work in teams, how to solve problems, right? These are the skills that are going to serve them well, no matter what they do and, and where they go in the future. So, um, Tammy, do you want to jump in or should I keep going? Uh, I don't hear anything from Tammy. There you go. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I still have no camera, but um, I'm happy to take over. Thank you for being patient while I rebooted my computer in the attempt to get my camera back. Um, so the um, so we're at how do students learn best and and really um, 
there are a couple of different ways that we might teach. And so if the one, one way to look at it is what is the student doing? So if the student is reading, listening, or watching, and that means they're being passive, um, we don't really know how much they're learning. Like it's really hard to tell. And evidence from research shows us that they're um, not necessarily learning as much as they could. But if they're active in their learning, if they're actually doing things um, using manipulatives or um, actively engaged especially if they're constructing their own knowledge, if they're um, doing things to kind of put those pieces together themselves, um, they tend to learn better. So if you go down that list, the, the most um, the interactive, where they're actually uh, interacting with each other more than even with the um, teacher, that they really, you know, for students, that really activates the way that they learn. Um, and oh, I can't control it. <laughs> so uh, Pogel is process-oriented guided inquiry learning, and it really is very active. Um, the, the students engage in classroom activities that really put them in a position where they're talking to each other, they're constructing, uh, they're each bringing their own background to the table, and they are together constructing their knowledge. The teacher is a facilitator, um, which is not uh, not a passive role. Sometimes I think if you're if you're just looking at a Pogo classroom, you might not realize how active a role the teacher has. Um, so the teacher is actually uh, typically walking around the classroom with the activity and really paying attention. So while the students are learning content, the teacher is learning about the students. And more specifically, learning about how the students are constructing their knowledge, if they have any misconceptions that they're bringing to the topic. Um, are they understanding the key concepts? And then, and then, in addition to all of that great content stuff, it's process-oriented. So in addition, um, in addition to paying attention or learning about how what your students know about the content, you can actually really learn a lot about where students are in their development of process skills or soft skills. Do they communicate well? How do they handle it when somebody else in their team challenges an answer that they gave? So this um, process-oriented aspect is is really a very active thing, although it's um, all kind of happening inside the teacher and is hard to see from the outside. So in guided inquiry, the students explore models um, or examples, however, whatever your activity has. They are led through a series of questions so that they um, come up, they sort of invent the concept, they get to their own understanding, and then they're given the, um, the terminology or the concept words that would go with it, and they can apply it um, in other contexts. <clears throat> so the one thing about Pogel activities is they use the learning cycle. So the learning cycle comes in initially with exploration, and that would be exploring the model. Um, and then they, um, through induction, they do their concept invention. Or figure out the main idea, or what is what is the um, the concept that we're learning today, and they discover it, and that's the um, inquiry part. And then they, through a process of deduction, they apply what they've learned to a new situation. So that would be, um, and that cycle can actually it could occur one learning cycle in a class period. It could be multiple learning cycles in one activity. Um, there's a lot of different ways to create activities within by using the learning cycle. But if you were to go through this a few times, at some point you, you close it or you um, end with the um, application. Great. Okay, so let's see. I think we're at a um, questions time, right? If, if we actually, have any... Go ahead. I was, 
I was just wondering, since Tammy wasn't able to join us at the very beginning, if you wanted to introduce yourself real quick there, Tammy. Oh, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Tammy Pierman. I'm, um, let's see, I've been teaching computer science principles using uh, Ralph Morelli's materials since before there was a CSP. <laughs> I used to use his, um, his course materials from Trinity, you know, back when, when it was just a college course. Um, I really like uh, App Inventor, and I've been using Pogol, thanks to Cliff. Cliff uh, is definitely the one who brought me into Pogol for, um, wow, like five years now, Cliff? I think it's been five years. And I mean, I can say from my experience with Pogol is it has been transformative to my teaching. Um, it has really... Uh, it is a fantastic pedagogy that works beautifully with computer science, and I've seen some great results with my students. Um, so we are, I'm, I'm actually very happy to um, be talking to you guys and introducing you to Pogol because I think Pogol and Mobile CSP is a great fit. Thanks, Tammy. I'll pass it back to you, Cliff. I don't think we have any questions coming right now through on the um, comment section of the watch page. So if you want to keep going, that's just fine. Great. Okay, so I'm going to sort of walk quickly through an activity that I usually do the very first day of my intro CS class. And you know, this typically takes about an hour. I'm going to go a lot faster than that. Um, Here's how it works. I say, we're going to think about a, a number guessing game. I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100, and you have to guess what it is. Jen, guess a number. 52. 52 is too high. Guess another number. 33. 33 is too high. Guess another number. 15. OK. So eventually, I'll either say you win or she'll get tired of guessing and the game ends. Okay, so the exploration is having the students play the game a few times, think about the rules, understand how it works. Then we say, now let's think about some different strategies that player B could use to guess numbers. So what's, what's one strategy player B could use? I'll let anybody else jump in here too. <laughs> I could have just like gone down by one every time instead sure. of you know jumping around numbers. Right. So so right. Every team will come up with a set of strategies. You could count up from one, one at a time. You could count down from a hundred. You could count up by tens and down by ones. You could just guess numbers at random. Right, and some teams will sort of get this idea that maybe you could guess 50, and then if 50 is too high, you could guess 25. So the idea is each team talks within the team and comes up with a list of strategies, and they write each strategy down in a worksheet. And then after all of the teams have several strategies, we ask each team to describe one strategy to the class. And so, the person presenting the strategy isn't presenting idea, the idea that their group has kind of vetted. But by the time four or five teams have each described a strategy, I as the teacher now know that every team in the room has the four or five different strategies that I want them to see. So they've, they've invented a set of strategies and so now we're going to think a little bit more about those strategies. So we have them rank the strategies by how quickly they'll find an answer and how easy or difficult it would be to describe the strategy to someone else. I say, you know, imagine you were talking to a first or second grader and you had to explain these strategies, which would be the easiest and which would be the most difficult. Then we have them multiply those two numbers together and add them to the worksheet and now teams have to describe in sentences the relationships between those two sets of rankings, right? So they have to look at what they've, the ratings they've come up with, and now they have to actually come up with sentences that describe it, 
right? That's, that's difficult for students, but the process of coming up with those sentences is going to help them really understand the relationship. And then, you know, I might just call on a team and ask them to describe it. I might ask each team to write a sentence on the board. There, there are several different ways I might get that information from them. Now the next phase, we say, okay, for each of your strategies, decide what's the largest number of guesses you might ever need and what's the a typical number of guesses on average, right? So if I'm counting up from one to 100, the worst case is I start at one and the answer is 99, I have to guess 100 times. The best case is I get lucky and I get it the first try. On average, I'm gonna have to try about 50. Right, so the teams spend some time arguing about this and figuring things out. And, you know, I've, I've told them almost nothing, right? I've asked them some questions. I might point out that there are patterns they see that aren't always correct, but they're thinking about these different ways of measuring. Once they're reasonably close there, now we say, well, suppose the range was one to a thousand rather than one to a hundred. Or, you know, depending a little bit on the students, I might suppose, suppose the range was any number n, what would happen? And so, again, the students are figuring this out and debating together, and every so often I might ask them to describe what they're doing to me or to the whole class or to write things down, but they're figuring out an awful lot of interesting ideas with, with very little direct intervention for me. So I just want to show you quickly what the worksheet looks like. They have a set of strategies in the first column, a set of ratings in the next few columns, then they're starting to predict worst and average for a range of 100, then for a range of 1,000, then for the case of n. So, you know, in in a typical first day of computer science class, pretty much all the teams get through this. They don't always get the the n columns right. But I want you to just think for a minute about what happens when we do that, right? So at the end of the first day of class, what have students learned about computer science? Well, they've learned that computer science is a place where we collaborate and interact. It's not the, you know, people sitting in cubicles typing at keyboards by themselves. They've learned that it's really about thinking critically and solving problems, not memorization. Right. Tell them, you know, we invented Google so we don't have to memorize things. They learn that it's really about designing and analyzing algorithms, right, ways of solving problems, even though they're going to spend a lot of time wrestling with semicolons and parentheses. And they see that we're really focused on comparing solutions, right? There are many problems that don't have a single right answer. So at the end of the first day of class, they've basically invented big O style algorithm analysis. I don't always tell them that. And they've come away with a really clear sense of what computer science is like as opposed to me spending an hour lecturing at them about the syllabus and the syntax of whatever bizarre language we're going to use that semester. So we're at sort of another break point if there are a few questions, or Tammy can start talking a little bit about some of the evidence that, that shows why this is a, an effective strategy. Hi Cliff, there actually was a question um, related to the learning process slide. So Nick asked um, about the groups and what happens when you get, say, a student in a group who knows the answer or model right away. So, you know, some of these students who come in may have already um, done some investigation of these concepts um, and explored things on their own. Um, what happens if they kind of shortcut that more stage for the other people in their group? Or how does the teacher help the teacher with that? So it doesn't um, so it's still a good thing at the moment for the whole group. Tammy, you want to take that? Sure, I'll take this one. Um, one of the things I do is, um, you know, I am lucky enough as a high school teacher that I sort of know, I sort of know who these kids are before I start. 
Um, and I will, I will just call it right out. I'll put it on the table and say, you know, if you already know, you know, if you already know the answers, it's still very important that you discuss it with your team. And I'll, and I will point out that having um, the best ideas is not useful if you can't communicate them. So what maybe what they're getting out of this activity is not learning about binary search, but it might be learning about how to communicate the algorithm you're thinking about to other people who don't necessarily understand it. And that that is a very valuable skill that they need to work on. That's great. Another thing you might do is if you have several students like that, put them on a team together and, you know, now they may move more quickly through the activity, but they're not going to be, you know, one student like that, if you're trying to have a discussion of the whole class, can really disrupt things. Whereas if they're working in small groups, there's usually less of a problem with that. We're going to talk more about these kind of facilitation strategies in a little bit. So that's that's a good question to kind of move us forward. Helen? Yes. So Cliff, if you go back one slide for a minute, I just wanted to remind everyone that, of course, um, what I see when I look at this about why computer science is such a good fit for Pogol and CS principles in, t in particular is that you can see a lot of the big ideas in CS principles are being emphasized with Pogol. So collaboration is being emphasized, creativity. Um, by the time students get through all this, they definitely understand that uh, there's more than one solution because they, and that they were able to come up with that solution with, through uh, collaboration and creativity. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, Pogol was first developed in, out of chemistry um, my personal opinion is that <laughs> I think they came up with it when they saw high fail rates in um, a lot of students dropping out and so they wanted to figure out what could they do to help more of their students do better, um, which of course is something we're concerned about in computer science. And the studies after 20 years and over 300 National Science Foundation grants uh, found it, uh, is that generally students are more engaged in these Pogo classrooms. but also that they're more, they perform better and they retain the material better. And so there are a lot of studies that show this. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, this is a study looked at general chemistry with the same instructors. So for four years, they had um, the same, these instructors lecture to their students on the left. And you can see that they um, had 19% A's, 33% B's and so on. Um, we have the D's, W's, and F's withdrawals and F's all together um, because those are the students who can't continue. You can see after the four years, they switched to Pogo, and a, more of their students got A's, a lot more got B's, a lot more got C's, and most importantly, the D's, W withdrawals, and F's dropped quite a bit in, um, in half, really. If we look at the next slide, this is a study I like a lot because it looked at um, how much students retained. So there were a group of students who took uh, a chemistry class the first semester with a lecture. In this, the second group of students had their first chemistry class as a Pogo class. And then in the second semester, they took a organic chemistry two which relies, of course, on passing and remembering all the material from the first semester. And they were all given a surprise quiz on the first day, unannounced. And of course, all of these students passed the first semester. They should all know it. But what you can see is the vast majority of the students who had the material as lecture scored under 50% on that first pop quiz. Whereas only the students who had the class in Polo actually remembered the material well enough to score over 90%. We have some 20% uh, of those students in the Polo classroom actually scored over 90%, um, really showing that those students retain the material better. And of course, this is extremely important for us in computer science. We need them to remember the material for the next class. Okay, next slide, please. So in computer science, um, we did a poll 
of computer science instructors and asked them what did they think their students got out of Kogel. And we saw a lot more stu uh, students seemed more engaged, they more, seemed more active. Um, they seemed to have a better understanding of the concepts by the end. Um, you'll note the bottom three uh, bars are actually the questions reversed. So it's actually a good thing that most of these instructors disagreed that the students would retain less from class and do worse on tests. And um, that some of them did uh, thought that it didn't, the with the Pogo classrooms, possibly um, in general, that they saw that their students were doing better, more engaged, they were more active. So on the next slide, we see that these are, this is where we're shifting now to how do we actually facilitate a POCO classroom? And the biggest shift for most of us teachers is that instead of lecturing, instead of talking to the students, instead of showing PowerPoints, we're really trying to encourage the students to work in teams to discover the content from themselves. And the challenge is, of course, not giving answers. So not necessarily telling them right away what, but when they ask a question, oh yes, here's the right answer, but rather, well, let's like take a look at the last question. How can you um, get, how can we work out the right answer from the last few questions that you've answered? And so really helping them connect the dots and seeing how uh, the concepts lead from one to another. Cliff and Tammy, did you have anything else to say about this one? Go ahead. OK, then let's move on. Um, what we see is there's a lot of questions about how different uh, instructors work with teams. Uh, some te people prefer groups of four for their group uh, computer science teams because then you can split the teams up into two for pair programming. So each group is a group of four and then you split them up when it's time to program into two pairs and then when it's time to bring back uh, the groups together and discuss the concepts, you bring them back into the groups of four. Of course when you're working with teams and you're creating those teams, if you're assigning them, we try not to isolate students by gender. So in other words, you try not to have one group with one female student and three male students. Um, generally, it is okay to mix abilities. Uh, as long as you go low to middle or middle to high, but not necessarily mixing groups where you have both uh, the students who are going to struggle the most as well as the ones that are uh, have the most background. Right? That low to high usually does cause a bit more problems. Um, I tend to keep my groups together for two to three weeks and then I switch them up. I know Cliff and Tammy do different things, so we can talk about that. Um, and I, the, you always have a few students who are going to struggle about how they're using um, about the polo classroom. They're going to be resistant to it. Usually it's actually the students who do get A's. Right? They're, they already know how to do things well learn from a book, they know how to learn well if you get, show a PowerPoint, and suddenly you're asking them to work with other students and they resist. They don't like try, uh, making that switch. And so it's helpful to remind them the benefits of Pogol, that they're learning new skills that are really important in terms of collaboration and learning how to communicate better with their peers. Cliff, did you have something? Okay. And so then we have, um, the roles that we might assign. And there are two different sets of roles that people tend to use for Pogo, but they generally are a manager who's keeping tr the team on schedule, a recorder who's recording the answers for the group, possibly in a Google Doc, a someone who's going to speak for the entire group, so that's a presenter or a speaker, and then the reflector or strategy analyst, or I also call that a process analyst. That person is the person in charge of the um, meta reflection that you are asking your group to do. So asking your group to think about what did you learn today? How might you work better together? Um, and this actually, this role can be key in terms of encouraging your group to respect each other and work well together. Rotate all my roles often. Um, 
and I emphasize that if you that after four times of working with the same people, you should have had every person try every role. And if not, you should be switching it um, more carefully. So if you have trouble getting your group to um, your students to switch regularly, you might be a little more um, structured about it and say, well, everyone uh, in your group might you might start them off with uh, putting them in alphabetical order. And then that way they remember that the next time the person who's second alphabetically is manager and the, the time after that, the person who's third alphabetically becomes manager. So you can certainly structure that to force them to uh, switch between the roles. The roles are something that I think a lot of instructors start off uh, a little more uncomfortable with. They tend to start off seeing it as, let me just put you in groups of four. But as you become more comfortable with Pogol, a lot of instructors realize that by using the roles, you actually work out a lot of the problems that you might have with group dynamics because you can remind students, wait, what's your role? Are you, um, who's the manager in this group? If for the, uh, are you staying on task? And that really helps you get the groups to work out their problems if, um, in terms of group dynamics. So Cliff, did you have, uh, I think we were gonna switch at this point. Is there, are there any questions in terms of um, Jen that people brought up? I think I we're think doing we're okay. So far. Okay. Okay, so, so you know, so uh, another strategy some people use is to just post a list of teams and roles, you know, on the door of the classroom each day. So you come in and you see, oh, this is the team I'm on, this is the role, but it's it's mostly to emphasize to the students that everyone needs to learn all of these roles because these are skills everyone needs. So the, the interesting thing is it takes a little while for the students to get comfortable with this, but then things pretty quickly flip and it can be hard to get the student's attention. Right, you would think if you had 20 or 30 kids working in a room that nobody would be able to concentrate, but in fact, often it's the opposite. They're so busy, they're so engaged that you need some way to get their attention. And so typically a teacher comes up with some signal either, you know, when I, when I want to talk to the class, I'll put up my hand. If you see my hand go up, put up your hand or I'll clap a pattern. You want a signal that will get students' attention without being too disruptive, right? You, I mean, I don't like shouting, but I also don't want to to break into a team's thoughts kind of in mid thought. So something that's a little more subtle, I think, works pretty well. Um, you know, Helen said some of this. Part of part of your role as an instructor is to monitor the teams and try to help them work effectively but you're really trying to get the students to do as much as possible. So things a teacher might say, you know, here are some examples, right? Don't tell them that there's a problem, but say, you know, manager, what, what could you do so see each other? Or manager, I noticed someone on your team is not paying attention, they're on their phone, what should you do about that? Or if the manager's the problem, that's where you might talk to the, the strategy analyst or the process analyst and say, um, you know, it seems like your team is having some difficulty with this. What, what could you do differently about it? So one of your jobs as an instructor is, is to try to monitor these things and but really try to cue the teams to solve the problems rather than telling them what to do. Um, another thing that you're trying to do is maintain pace in the classroom. You know, if some students will race through, they've been conditioned to just give me a worksheet, I fill in the blanks as fast as I can and throw it back. Other students, and actually I've had more problems doing this with faculty than with students, they want to talk and talk and talk. And so you, you need different ways to pace them to say, well, you know, if you haven't finished question three, you're behind. Or 
in three minutes you need to have gotten to question four or this is a this question shouldn't require a lot of thought if you're still on it move on or ask me or you know you, some set of cues so that the students know how quickly they need to be moving they're not overthinking some questions or underthinking other questions but you also want the students to be describing what they're learning to each other so that everyone is confident they have the right answers without you telling them what the answers are and so in in pogo we call this reporting out which can take a bunch of different forms you might you know ask each team to describe a strategy they've come up with you might say does your team have a different answer from what you've just heard you might have each team send one team member to another team to compare answers and explain things to each other you know that that can be a good strategy in a very large class where you wouldn't have time for every team to present something or you might have teams you know draw something on a piece of paper and hold it up or go up to the board and draw something or you know sometimes i'll put a big grid on the board and then have each team fill in one column of that grid sorry i realize i'm waving my hands and you can't see my hands moving but so so there are a whole strat set of strategies to doing this and um that's sort of the end of the slides we had we wanted to leave some time for q a but we also wanted to leave you a bunch of links. So the, the main Pogo project has all kinds of information, sample activities, guides for instructors. In particular, there's this amazing set of three-day workshops where they walk you through more of the research and theory behind it. There are four or five workshops just on ways of facilitating classes four or five workshops on designing activities choosing good models designing sequences of questions and and the thing i think that's that's really most impressive is that most of these workshops actually use pogol to teach pogol these aren't workshops where people are you know lecturing at you with slides to tell you why you shouldn't lecture but they're really modeling this approach and so you know sometimes as a teacher you're being a student just trying to finish an activity other times you're doing an activity that's guiding you to understand how these activities work um, the cs pogo website has activities for cs 0 cs 1 cs principles some more advanced courses um, in a lot of cases we have sort of a a sample part of the activity and we ask you to contact us that's mostly because we found that students will google the activity <laughs> to try to find the answers and because we really want to get feedback from people that use them so we'd encourage you to contact us so our contact info is there and i think you know and maybe helen or tammy want to comment on things that i said or we can open it up for questions great thank you clef um, Helen or Tammy, did you have anything last comment that you wanted to add before we take some questions? So this is Helen, and I was going to emphasize the reporting out is key. Um, at the very end of the activities, the, um, especially when students see it as a worksheet, they don't understand yet um, how Pogo is different from what they're seeing in other classes, it can, becomes really important to emphasize to the students the goal of Pogol is not to get the activity finished. It's to get the students to discover something for themselves through that process. And so at the end of that, for the teacher to bring it all together again, so to have the reporting out and to talk through what were the most important concepts that we just went through and bring it all together. I think that's the key to helping students learn um, from this process. Otherwise, it's very easy for some for students to go through the process of uh, completing the activity without pulling together the key ideas. Thanks, Helen. 
Um, we did have a question from Mark. I agree, Mark. she said that very well. Okay. <laughs> we did have a question from Mark um, asking about how you explain the importance of the roles to students. Um, if anybody would like to address that one. I'll pop on with this one. Um, we actually have an activity uh, for roles that you that is um, available. So <clears throat> I'll have to get that from you and connect it into the mobile CSP materials. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll give it to you. Great. So, um, and it it pretty much walks the students through, um, you know, kind of making that connection to the real world and and why. You know, the fact that people have roles in careers and that employers are looking, they're assuming content knowledge and they're looking for people with these process skills. And so it, it makes it really clear to them up front that in addition to learning computer science, I'm learning, I'm going to also learn valuable employability skills. Um, and I do make a point to them that even if they're 15, they can use these skills on their very first job. Like this, these are not skills that you have to wait until you're out of college to use. You can use them at the local Wawa or gas station or wherever it is you're working. Um, and that really does help. Thanks, Tammy. Um, I was also going, I was also reminded that we made an update to all of the Pogo lessons and added in the worksheets. So for those of you um, who have maybe used some of the earlier Pogo lessons in class, as you look for the new ones, just know that there are worksheets now that have the set of questions so that if you want those as handouts in the classroom or if you want students to be able to, um, you know, make a copy of the Google Doc and use them um, and share them with you that way, um, those are there for you as a tool. And I'll get the information from Tammy about the activity on roles so that we can add that in there as well if you'd like to try that in your classroom. Are there other questions people have about Pogol? So while we're waiting, if anyone wants to jump in with a question, I'll mention that to also support the roles, there are role cards, which I think were on the slide, mentioned on a slide, but I think that we didn't point that out. Um, the role cards, uh, uh, have on each of them not only what the purpose of the role is, but it has some for each responsibility. It lists some uh, ways that a student might lead their group if something goes wrong. For example, if your group is talking about the weekend and you want to get them back on task, how might you say that? Well, a lot of students are feel a little shy about that. They're not sure how to say that. And so there's actually something, some language on some of those role cards that will help them figure out how do they say it, which is really improving their communication skills and making them stronger in terms of uh, becoming leaders in their groups. And I think Tammy just provided a link, which I'm sure, uh, Jen, you could share with everyone. Yep, absolutely. I was going to say that I've used those, um, the cards myself when I have used Pogol now this um, fall semester with my data structures class. I'm using it in the um, CS principles class, but haven't introduced the role cards yet, but they are a very helpful reminder, like you said, for students to have right there on the desk, what it is they're supposed to be doing and thinking about in their role. And, you know, especially for, I think for some younger students, um, how do you redirect the conversation may be an issue. And it has prompts, like Ellen said, for how you do that. So it's nice. The cards are also nice for the teacher because now it's very easy, you know, especially if you have cards that are a different color for each role, it's very easy to walk up to a table and see, you know, pink should be the speaker, red should be the manager. So it's it makes it easy to to sort of know who's supposed to be doing which thing and catch people that that aren't. And it's, I, I think it's also a nice cue for the students. I mean, even sometimes the students will use the cues sort of self-consciously, right? They'll hold the card up and say, manager, why aren't you? <laughs> but, but it makes the point and it, you know, it gives them a little more confidence because they're sort of quoting something that's been given to them, but it, but I think over time, 
it makes a big difference. I guess, you know, another thing I'll say while we're waiting for questions is that I think people often find at the beginning of a term, these activities tend to go kind of slowly, right? Students are still figuring out the roles and you're giving them diagrams to look at or samples of code to look at. But because the activities are really guiding students to develop the kinds of skills they need, as the semester goes on, they get better at working together and they get better at describing in sentences things they've understood and they get better at looking at graphs or looking at code or and so I think often there's sort of a little bit of an acceleration that happens where you know by the end of the semester you realize these students are doing things that that are beyond what you would typically see in a, in a class like this. I think um, one good thing that you said that I realized I just didn't I did not do and think to do be, maybe because I've been able to go to a pogo workshop in person is to have different colors for each of the role cards so you can easily see who is who in the group right now all of mine are the same color and I can see where that would be um, helpful and I'll just point out that the role information um, is now linked in the agenda. I think we also have the roll cards linked on each of the teacher the lesson plans on the teach side too. I can add okay, another. This, this is Sherry. Go ahead, Sherry, and then we'll Sorry, come back Tammy. to Tammy. Yeah, yeah. This is this is Sherry, and I just have a comment. I was just um, thinking that for a lot of teachers, this might be a new and different way of teaching. But you provided some very compelling evidence in terms of how students. Um, have, have have a better potential for student achievement on the concept. So I think um, when we're teaching, it's sometimes hard to change our strategy, but it really sounds like it's worth it. And I appreciate you sharing all these different perspectives um, on this approach. So I would encourage our listeners to you know give it a try, even though if it, it might feel a little bit uncomfortable at first. It's often like that when we're trying something new as teachers. And I think, you know, in my conversations with um, Cliff, Helen, and Tammy, all of you have shared as well that it's not something teachers should expect to be perfect at right away, you know, just like you wouldn't expect your students to be perfect at it right away either, that it's a process and that you'll learn to become more comfortable and um, learn what you need to do in the classroom to make it work for your students. So, Tammy, you had said or wanted to share something else? Yeah, I was just going to uh, add another great benefit of the cards being in colors is that one thing you can do is say, like, for example, in my classroom, I have rectangular tables. So I can say that the front right corner should have the pink card today. Like I can rotate the roll cards by color so that so I'm not leaving it up to the students to voluntarily take on um, a roll they have seats and we rotate the roll cards and I can quickly see just by glancing at the room that the front right corner of every table has the pink card. <clears throat> so that's one way. Sounds good. Yeah, I know for me as a college professor, I sometimes forget about the class arrangements that you might have in a high school classroom and how they can differ from what we see. And, you know, sometimes you're in your lab classroom and sometimes you're in um, a non-lab classroom and you can have different arrangements there too. Um, Ralph wanted me to point out that we are also looking, you know, so we did maybe I think six or seven lessons or so this year with Pogol and we're going to, you know, be wanting your feedback on how it works and ways we can improve activities and try to be um, incorporating more of them where it seems appropriate in the curriculum as we move forward. So if people have suggestions about it um, as you're using the Pogo activities, what's working, not working with your students, um, where you think Pogo might be a good fit for other activities, you know, love to hear those kind of suggestions and or, you know, working, always working to make the curriculum better. I think we said this earlier, but I think it bears repeating, which is that you know, when the students are doing most of the work in the classroom, as the teacher, you learn an incredible amount about what the students really understand and where they struggle, right? I've, I've had plenty of experiences where 
you know, I thought I explained something really well, <laughs> and none of the students had any questions. And then a week or two later, it became clear from a homework or an exam or a discussion in class that that they completely didn't understand what I was saying. And you know, when they're when they're working through one of these activities, it becomes very clear very quickly where those problems are, which can be kind of humbling as a teacher. <laughs> I taught you this last week. <laughs> you don't remember it? Why? But but it means you find out and and you can respond. And so, you know, every time I do an activity, I end up with a page of notes of, you know, this question was confusing to these students. Here was an example that worked really well. I left out a question that would have helped them figure things out. And to me, that's that's sort of a secret benefit, right? Is that it? It really. I don't know how many of you use unit testing when you write code, but it's sort of like having a a big set of unit tests, right? Every time you try something, you get a bunch of feedback very quickly about what works and what doesn't, and and what you need to change. Great, thanks, Cliff. I just put a note out there that it was a last call for questions. We actually had um, a nice suggestion from Mary who uses roll cards, um, not necessarily POGO roll cards, but roll cards for other group activities. Um, and she says that she's got them so that they form a parallelogram and that slides over her basket that has pens and highlighters and that's in the center of every table. So <laughs> kind of a nice way to you know, center your groups and your students. I will maybe hang on one more moment here and see if there's any other questions that come on. But um, while we're waiting to see if there's any others, um, thank you very much, um, Cliff, Helen, and Tammy for um, being willing to present to us today and go through um, a little bit more in depth about Pogol and the research behind it and how to really use it effectively in the classroom as a teacher, how to make that happen. We appreciate you taking time, not just to be here, but the time and thought that you put into preparing the presentation and thinking about what our teachers need. So, thank you very much. Oh, happy. This is lots of fun. <laughs> Thanks for being here. It was wonderful. All right. Looks like we are good and that there aren't any more um, questions coming in. So. Again, thanks, and um, I will get this webinar and some of those program materials incorporated into the mobile CSP teacher side. And of course, it's all linked on the YouTube page if you need to come back and watch it again. Have a great evening.